So, uh, interesting room. Um, I'm always worried because I'm showing artwork that sometimes the monitor is hard to see, but luckily everyone has a local one. And it means, I think, also that we could be a little bit more informal. So I think if there's a question or I'm saying something, just maybe raise your hand and I'll double check where you might be and then we can talk about it. Uh, silly me, because I'm from New York and gestural, I probably will gesture here a lot. I'll try and keep remembering to, to uh, gesture on here. So that's the cursor. Then you could look here, but you could also look on your ears. Um, gee whiz, uh, I could be nervous. And then I had to listen to a speech. And it's the first time I was listening to someone telling, talking to me as I start while watching on 10 monitors, my heart beating. Because if you look at this figure, it's pulsing. And it's pulsing because I'm wearing uh, an Empatica watch. So this, this came out of the MIT Media Lab and is a, a startup. So it's tracking my, my, um, my heart rate, uh, galvanic response, which is kind of the sweat, and a number of other things. Um, and I'll, I'll oh, I'm going faster. I'm getting more nervous. So sometimes to show you, jog a little bit. It doesn't take my heart very long to get faster. But there you go. See, it's so much so now that you can't even tell and then it'll count back down again. So I'll show you a little bit more of this. Sometimes it's just it's hard to set up in the middle of a, of a presentation, so I like to just start it in the beginning. So um, I'm going to talk to you about art and AI art. One of the wonderful things about art is it engages us. I can take a picture of someone in the room, and that would be nice, and if I took it well, that would be great. I could get a painter like Rembrandt to paint it, and which one do people go online, pay millions of dollars for, get enthralled being in front of? Of course, it's the painting. So one thing that's amazing about art is it engages you. Uh, we try and make art that engages, and I've been an artist for a long time uh, with some of this in mind. Um, one of the things about putting art in a computer, AI or not, is if you're doing it in a particular way, which is the only way I do it, which is it's a, imagine a box. And in this box is your creativity. There's nothing there, but you sit there and, and make it. So it makes paintings on its own, or dances on its own, or pulses on its own. And then you can do things to kind of change it, but now you have variability. So I think one of the big things that I'm going to talk about, at least from the application space today, is art already engages people. So that's good compared to looking at a desktop or Excel. They're going to be real excited to look at art. That we can vary the art in all these kinds of ways, and we tend to be more cognitive when we think about that. Well, variability, changing something, you know, saying, hey, you need to calm down. And if you wear this watch and you look at art and you breathe, that calms you down. And then we're taking the variability of art, and we could do education or health. So this notion of engagement and variability means that we can do a, a lot of interesting things, surely even understanding art by changing it and seeing how people feel about it. So I'll be talking a little bit about that. And one example is at least is this. So, so, so um, I'll probably, uh, I have given other talks on VR, and we were talking about, you know, in a few months, maybe I could do a, a VR talk as well. And we're very big on this biosensing, making VR more human by, by my breath and my, and my voice and how I gesture and what we're doing here with the biosensing. Um, so I'm not going to get deeply into it, but it turns out the AI art also uh, is a way you literally can dance it and you can drum it. And this is just one extreme example that you could, uh, it could be literally part of you, uh, which in this case it is. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about AI. AI has a lot of issues. I've been teaching AI for, for years, uh, not just on the art side. I'm going to stick mainly to the art side. but. It's AI, so I'm going to bring up ethics a lot. And I'm going to start with the worst ethics right now. Here's a watch. That's my heartbeat right there. And I happen to know the MIT Media Lab spinoff wants this data. So the data is going from BC 
all the way to the U.S. to to you know uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. They're collecting that data, and it goes back. I would like to. I typically. Oh, maybe I don't want to move too far away from the camera. Let's say this gentleman here has got a similar head to me. He's got glasses like me. I'm actually slightly in love with him. I, I don't really want you to know about it, but it turns out every time I get close to him, my heart flutters a little bit, so, and it, it will show up. So if you're wearing this watch, you are giving your internal data away. You are. That's pretty brutal to kind of go, sorry, you keep going near the dean, and your heart goes faster. What is that? You're like, nothing, nothing. So, uh, and obviously that it's, so obviously when you're thinking about privacy and security, it's one thing to have your email and things being, but now we're literally talking about like your thoughts and your feelings. So obviously there's, there's goods and bads with this. Okay, so um, like I said, if I uh, uh, say anything that really, <laughs> one thing I like to do is get this watch off me as soon as possible, since I know I'm being tracked when I wear it. Uh, you'll see more, I'll, I'll bring it up from time to time. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my slide set. Beginning. So, um, making art with artificial intelligence. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about that and how that works. So, you know a little bit about me. I've always been an artist uh, and a scientist. I used to have to separate them. So, I think it was somewhere around Stanford that I, which was 2002, that I was able to start like getting credit for being both. But if, if other ones of you in the same situation, the notion that I needed a science resume different than my art resume because, it, because the people I'm talking to at the Whitney would not appreciate these 100 papers that you talked about. And the people with the 100 papers are going to think, well, what is this weird, softy art stuff that he has? But um, I think, uh, and there's a lot of young people in the room, I think putting these things together totally makes sense and has always made sense. Uh, uh, so I'm at, I'm at uh, this school. I came up from Stanford, knew nothing about this area at all. And, uh, and I'm sorry, this is a funny place to be, but because they were combining art and science in this research way uh, um, with a lot of nice things, and this is SIA, I left Stanford. People were like, what, what? what? Uh, and San Francisco, because I, I like that they mix it together. So uh, I'll be showing you that. Uh, but I have a research lab there with about eight PhDs, two master students. Uh, most of my PhDs are women, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, most of the PhDs, over 80 of them, which is a lot for a research school in general, are women, 51% women. Most of the masters are women, and most of the 700 undergraduates are women. So we're quite proud uh, technology schools are in the 16% women, and they have huge conferences to try and bring that number up. So we're very excited that with, with interdisciplinarity, with mixing science with humanities and things, that there, there is a better way to do things. And surely having women is always a better way to do things. So I'm very happy with the, the folks in my lab, and you'll, you'll see some of them. Um, so we do things with a little bit of cognitive science. If you're going to think about how people paint and how people are creative, that there's many approaches to doing that. Our approach is well, what, what's happening in the brain, and not always the neural science of the brain, just algorithmically what's happening in the brain. Because we're basically, if we're back to this thing that there's an empty box of nothingness, and I want to put creativity in it, that I probably would need a model for, for and that model, the way I get that model, is thinking deeply about how artists draw and paint and sing and, other th and dance, uh, and that's what we're putting in. Okay, so that's a good introduction to me. So again, the research lab looks at expression, what I'm, I'm expressing now. I'm being emotional, uh, gesture, the way I'm talking, personality, behavior, and then this high-level thing called creativity. And some people think, why would you possibly want to use computers to model such things as facial expression and creativity in art? Um, but we see these two benefits. The second one is, um, uh, we think the more of this you put in your computer, the more it responds to you, rather than us having to respond to a computer or not. So I, we're trying to move from communication systems to expression systems. Uh, a saxophone player knows how to express their soul. Can't we do that a little bit better with something a little bit better than just text and graphics as a way of doing that? And that's some of the things we're trying to do. 
also a lot of what we do is cog science. We we do when we make this art and think about it, we're we're thinking about very simple questions and parameterization of how people are creative. Okay, so um, so um, if I'm using my body, well, that's the voice, that's movement, that's the intent about what I want to do, that's emotions. And a lot of those I'm now using with sensors. So you saw the heart rate sensor. I'll be doing a lot with a hand motion center sensor. I have a breath sensor. We have a lot of ones that we do. Then what are we doing? Well, we're doing visuals and sound and media and VR and AR and 360. And I'll show you more of the, the art side of that. And then hopefully there's some interaction. It's not so much what's on the screen. It's not so much. It's the experience space between them, how a painting affects you. And with computers, you can play a little bit more in that space. It's affecting me so much that my heart rate is changing. Oh, now this is. So it's the experience space between those. And I've explained we tend to use this more rigorous modeling technique. And we do experiments to make sure we get it right in the cog science domain. OK, so. Um, so cog science then is human mind, it's, and so we do a lot with creativity. But if it's painting, it's a lot of how you see colors, shapes, so how you, how you perceive things. The computational creativity part is making tools like a Photoshop for, for creative people. And hopefully, some of you will want to use the tools that I'm showing you. Uh, uh, but some of it is we do is automatic creativity. Again, in a box, we teach an AI to be cr creative on its own. And we just leave it alone and see what it does. Uh, the AI side is going to be a little tricky. How many people are computer scientists and know a little bit about AI? So we have, of the people we even raised their hands, they raised it about this high. So, um, so I'm not going to go deeply into it. There's papers on every one of these things, and you can go there. there the, the lie is there that AI is a thing. I always hate when people say the AI or AI will kill us or whatever it is, because there's so many different methods and all of them are faking it at some level and I'll do my best to explain. And often if you want to emulate humanness, you're using, I'm using several different AIs at once. So we had, if you noticed before, well, some of you maybe weren't here, but I had, I had that dancer piece up. That dancer piece has four different AIs to, to figure it out. One is cubist, right? Just AI about how would you make things in planes, right? There's an AI doing that. And then there's another AI that's thinking of, oh, I, I really want to put in ink lines. I really like those kinds of lines. How would I do that? And, and, oh, and then that's only the idea of a painting. Some, another algorithm, a different AI, actually does the painting and tries to think about, well, what would be a human way to paint? And what's the history of painting and all that kind of stuff? Um, so no one method, uh, uh, several methods. Again, we're trying to emulate this creativity. Um, there's this term AGI that you're going to hear more and more. And be very skeptical when you hear it, which is just AI with the G in the middle. <laughs> I think it, it was a cute way to do it, even though it usually stands for general AI. So that's this notion that there's an artificial intelligence that isn't just for painting or just for car driving or just for this. But it's, it's the one you'll see in robots, and they're going to come and kill us one day. But it's the total, it's a total, it, it's, it does everything. And I can tell you that it just doesn't exist at all in any form. Almost anyone doing AI tends to almost be an expert in the space they're doing. If AI really worked, you would not be an expert in the space of painting. You would just kind of go, I have no idea, make up a painting. But almost everyone is really doing it other ways. So versus this multi-AI solution, which is more what I'm going to be showing you. So there's different AI techniques. It's complex math and logic and coding. So there's only so much I can do here at this point. I gave a computer science talk over the computer science building, and we got more into it. And even there, there's so many different styles. But I'll be showing you at least three big ones. Genetic programming, which is you evolve creativity. It's how we became creative. You know, uh, uh, we, we, there were strategies. Uh, that, your, that your mom had, and that your father had, and they married, and some of those strategies got mixed to make you, and onward through time, well, we do that in a way. The, the nice thing about genetic programming, it tends to, if you think of a search space, so here's all the possible paintings that look like a dancer in planar form. There's really good ones over here. There's kind of good ones over here, too. And if you were to try and, and you started here, how would you get there? With certain people who are not creative, would just kind of like, well, it's good. And, and you would just, but creative people kind of go, there should have been here. I can't find it. I'm going to the beach. I'm taking a shower. Oh, and they have an aha moment. And they end up in the search space. So if you're here, and here's the search space, you open up to all the possibilities. 
and then bam, you aha to where you want. So genetic programming has this wonderful way of doing what Paul McCartney and other creative people do, which is kind of gestating things and all of a sudden coming. I'll show you basic neural networks, which have been around for a while. And then the range that everyone talks about is these deep learning systems. And I'll be talking a lot about, about those as well, too. Um, so are there uses other than just, excuse me, other than just for art? Uh, there are. So um, I was just down at Stanford again, and I was talking to all these neuroscientists. So they, they threw me into the notion of, of brain disorders. So one of, the other, one of the things we're doing with AI art is we like art. Our brain likes art, and therefore, uh, we understand a little bit more how the brain works, surely how creativity works by testing these models, how perception works, and techniques and geniuses of artists. So I'm, I'm known and got my PhD here at the interdisciplinary school at UBC so many years ago in showing how Rembrandt understood how vision worked better than anyone else, and it's because I made a model to do that, and I will show you that. And so some of this literally, even though it's about computer art, in it, because we can parse it and do studies on it, we can show why artists are just as good as scientists about understanding the world and passing that on. And I'm somewhat known to do that. I gave a, this is a pretty big talk here, but I gave a talk to 1,000 people at the National Portrait, uh, the National Gallery in London. So that was like, okay, that, that was one of my biggest, right? And serious, there was Rembrandt experts and some. And I was making the case as strong as I could that it was all in Rembrandt's art. Everything that scientists knew and everything that he didn't write it down, that's not what he does. If a scientist at the time knew what he knew, you know, would he pass it on as well as, as Rembrandt did? So I'll show you some of that work. Surely we're doing a lot in e-health. You look at art, and especially with some of these sensing systems, you could de-stress, you could calm down, you could refocus. So we're doing work with Fraser Health and um, Curatio is, is a company in town that got the most money ever, or a lot, from um, uh, Shark Tank. So it's got 12 names, I can't remember which one. Um, so they're a local group that actually, if, if you, God forbid, find yourself with cancer or something like that, they will hook you up with other people who have a similar problem to you and they all get together. And we're using some of these techniques to, to help there. Again, I've already said art is engaging, so it's the variability that we can do in the computer plus the engaging that allows us to do this education and health. We're also doing a lot in journalism, movies, and communication. So it turns out AI art, or making art that moves, is also good to show off how cells work or how somebody is upset. Um, uh, so we just got a very big grant, a Google Knight Foundation grant in in, in because they want to know more about how 360 video works. And then we're specifically doing something with anonymization, which is we actually turn a, a person who's being interviewed, who we really do not want to show their face, into a painting, enough where you can't see who they are, but hopefully where all their emotion is still coming out. What's the number one way they do anonymization now? Anyone want to say, when you, when you watch an interviewee and they can't show the face, what do they typically do? Pixelization. So that's number one. Someone said, you know, lower the lights. That's probably three. Blurring is two. And pixelization is the number one way to do it. If you use the best one, even with a little AI in, it's, it's an after effects if some of you use it. It's pixelization three or something like that, which, is the, which, which will at least try and follow the face and pixelate it so it's not all that stupid. And there, you, move, you lose all the eyes, everything. So what, we'll show you some of the techniques that we're hoping that we're doing that with UBC Journalism School here. 800 people tried to get these grants, and only five did, so we're very happy. OK, so here's one of the things we're trying to do. That's a picture of, of, a, of, a, of a woman. And somehow, there's a painting over here. And that painting uh, is all the magic. And how can that be? How, what does an artist do? To, again, the photograph is real. It's scientific. And the one on the other side is distortion. It's incorrect. But yet, artists exploit your vision and your perception uh, um, to, to do things you like. And in those things that you like, you like that, that painting better. And in doing so, um, it actually gives you more of who this person really is than the real one. Uh, Joni Mitchell likes to say, art starts with the word artificial. 
and you do something artificial to tell a deeper truth. So a lot of this art is, in fact, moving off the scientific reel to bring all these other things. I'm going to lower the lights a little bit so you can see the art better and, and me less better, which seems like a good thing. Um, OK. So there's a growing notion or recognition in cognitive science that artists are neuroscientists, that they've discovered valuable ways of understanding and working with you know, notions of color and perception and how your brain works to achieve a desired experience. You like that painting because your brain likes that painting. And there's a number of tricks that they use that we now know uh, um, speak to how the brain works. So what we try to do, whether it's, whether it's a painting space or faces or anything, is there's knowledge of that. We try and turn that knowledge into axes. And then we have computer programs and things that you can move sliders around. And we'd say this is every kind of painting or every human face. Well, as long as you're moving the smile parameter in this one, we know. So that we're, we like to make these search spaces as a way to do it. So we do it very much in, in, in our face systems. And I, if I, uh, when I give a talk on VR, I would do a lot more on faces. We, for the Vancouver Aquarium, we've literally using AI have modeled whales. Uh, and you can see these whales moving things. Now, let's just stop for a second there on the ethics there. Every, these whales that I have here, if I brought it up and I just want for speed now, um, they would move quite realistically. The, the, the baby will follow the mother, the sounds would be real. Those sounds, they came from whales at the aquarium. The way they move, they came from videos at the aquarium. All those whales are no longer alive. So we have scanned data from whales to make not real whales, uh, and, and that's, that's an issue, and whether whales should be here, as you know. Um, within that, and again, it's a side talk, but at least I want to keep bringing the ethics home, right? So we're working with the aquarium and other aquariums uh, to keep all of these things out of zoos. So how would you do that, or aquariums? We call them cable zoos, because there's a notion, uh, in the old days, you used to have to put on this tank and go into the water and hardly breathe, and you get 10 minutes. But now they realize, well, screw that. We'll just build the same tank with cameras, and we'll put a cable all the way back. And all we have to do, like drone work, is do it that way. So we're, they're using that notion in this space. So the idea is, like, what is an aquarium at this level anyway? It's a room with a window with fish on the other side, or in this case, mammals on the other side. So we were thinking we would make computer graphics, mammals, like this. Well, that's not the real thing, though. But just like I sensed my, there would be a real whale in the wild or a real Bengal tiger in the wild. And we would put a camera, excuse me, camera on the head and, uh, uh, and maybe other sensors and trip photography everywhere. So we could monitor, you know, Harry the Bengal tiger. And you're seeing him when you go to the zoo. It's not really, I mean, he's, he's still where he likes to live. But in fact, you know, uh, you're seeing them up front. So there's issues. I bring this one up early because there is a notion of is it art or is it the facsimile of art? And this is the same thing. If you have a tiger in the wild and you're keeping him in the wild, but you want to teach kids in this neighborhood what the tiger is like, do you really need a tiger there? Or do you need everything about the tiger but in virtual form? And at some point, you can say, oh, see when he stalks how his heartbeat goes? And that's something you might not notice with a real, but here we can put all these other things. So this is this, this beginning, the notion of AI. Uh, we do this with um, electronic arts. And I used to work. I ran the research group at Electronic Arts in California once upon a time before I went back to Stanford. And we do it with characters. So. Uh, that's wonderful, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to stick to art. So research, researchers not, have not typically analyzed or modeled the passed down methodology that artists use. Scientists, you know, we should explore artists' work from a cognitive standpoint. We can use the strong analysis of art painterly process aligned with scientific to really understand things. So this is my, hopefully you're seeing it pretty good. This is, this was not, sorry, I'll, do, I'll get used to this. This. Can you can see my cursor right yes. This was not painted by a human. This was surely me painstaking hours, but I coded a system that painted this. This is, in fact, a grad student of mine, and it, it took her, uh, uh, her facade. And then I learned everything I could about 
and put it into the system about Rembrandt, and we painted mm -hmm. we painted a Rembrandt. Um, so, and here's a, uh, a, another student and, and how they did it. So a lot of, now people are talking about, so the, the amazing thing is ours have recorded experiments on visual and perception science for, for you know, a thousand years. So they've been enhancing, based on how your brain works, these portraits. So we can really learn a lot from them, okay? So that gives you an idea of, of motivation. This is the kind of standard stuff we would be doing at my lab. So, for instance, we're sure we're doing a lot with, with uh, uh, so I'm, I do a lot with human and, and expression. Art is expression, but so is this human thing. So I'm, many people know me as a facial animation expert, how faces move. And so you'll see a lot of my artwork are portraits because I'm in love with the human face and, and everything about it. But we also do full character stuff. Um, we do it where it's the body, so in this case somebody is is actually dancing, and then we track how they dance, and then we turn that into an art piece. So this is this notion that once you have variability in art, there's so many ways you can do it. Here at UBC in the Vision uh, Lab, Jim Enns Lab, we have uh, an artist who's a PhD with me, Souk, um, draws this hand over and over again. It takes about 10 minutes to do something like this. So she's looking at this, she's drawing this, and we're tracking uh, uh, where she's looking, and, um, and everything about her, literally the pressure to understand art in kind of a deep way. And then it goes into application space uh, and new, new forms of painting, like in VR. OK, so we've been through this. This is, by the way, the real whale at the aquarium. Uh, these were the beluga whales when they were up. This is about 20 feet across, so we try to get a realistic size. These are the things you can do with art or other things is you can, you can visualize them in different kinds of ways. And then sometimes you can put these on large screens. We did this whole thing about Picasso and, um, and Guernica, so, uh, which is uh, a lot of us creative people argue about the, this huge mural. I'm from New York City, so I used to visit Guernica once every two weeks for years and years and years because it was just sitting in the, in the MoMA. And it's amazing, it's big, you know. And then the, the, the rap was that it can't go back to Spain until Spain is no longer um, um, a fascist country. There's a lot of, <laughs> yes, the moment kept going, I still think they're fascist. I don't think we should get them back in. Um, before it went back, though, um, they had all the sketches that, he, that Picasso made. He made over 70 sketches. So Picasso was doing uh, uh, the Paris exhibition, you know, just like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm you had down here uh, with the exhibition that was here. So he was doing the, uh, the he was going to do the Spanish mural, and he couldn't give a crap. He had nothing to do with it. And then he heard that uh, Franco let the Nazis experiment on this thing called total war and bomb this, this small town with this mi Spanish minorities in it. And they bombed it, and as they were running out, he, they were shooting them, which was terrible. And from that moment on, from not having a creative idea, to this, the, what everyone believes is a masterpiece. He did these sketches. So all us creative people argue about these sketches and how creativity works. So we're able to show things like that as well. And of course, we're doing a lot of the bit with, with faces, and I'll show you more of that. Um, art is actually good to understand things. For instance, we know with autism, when they're not as good as you at um, uh, people not on the spectrum, on, um, on, on seeing a face and seeing all the heavy duty stuff. And wh why is that? Why, when they look at a more realistic face, can they not zone in on it? Well, one of the things, it could be this, it's just too much for them to think about. So we've tried this where we, we take out the textures, and then we actually just go to a line drawing and seeing if they're better at it. So again, art can be used in this way as well. Uh, we've done the study, and they're not better at it. So. It's a deeper problem. So to be clear, in case you're interested on the comic side, there's social complexity. Are they just not good at social? Or is it just, well, you know, uh, it turns out you look at things that are moving. You look at things that are sharp. So you're looking at all these other things, but something in your brain says, I will filter those out and only care about this person talking to me. Um, and uh, so we were hoping, well, we'll filter out for you. 
and we'll see if it's if it's just a complexity problem or a deeper social and it, it, it still appears to be a deeper social um, uh, so once you can do art you can put art on anything so I've done a lot of videos and, and installations in these museums and such that um, that I can take human movement and paint it and have a choreographed face so um, so I've done that a bunch so this was the the electronic German group craft work that um, I worked with Nam June Paik and did a piece on. So this was a long time ago. 1990. So in 1990, people went crazy saying, you know, maybe media is an art form. And they had the very first kind of media show, and it was very controversial media. TV, computer screens, that'll never be art. So uh, these are the old computer, you know, remember those old boxes of CRTs? So this is 70 feet across. and. Uh, 30 feet high, and these are all different TVs, and I did a piece with Nam June Paik, who's very well known. Uh, even though we did crap work in 1988, people say, how did you get into these museums? And they said that to a famous computer artist, and she said, um, which stunned me, because it seemed to be about right, she said, keep your health, because it's going to take about 30 years. So you just at least didn't have to be healthy enough to last for 30 years so people can, you know, so you can show it. So this is my thing. 1988, I made this, uh, Nam June Pink, uh, a few years later. But for me to get into the MoMA or the Tate Gallery, I had to wait till, till um, 2013 to release this work. So these are computer pieces that I've done over the years um, to show you what they look like. Um, one of the things also with sensing, though, is we can start sensing the human face. So you can look at art. We can see how you're looking at it. We can change the art as you're going. This is Neelai, one of my grad students, who's working with me on some of the sensing software. So I mentioned that we were going to do genetic programming. So this was a very well-known piece I did that, that went around the world. This was the first time I realized I was more of a, uh, in a box. I made this piece that went, that worked for 30 days. And I just curated what I thought were reasonable pictures. And then it turns out that did better uh, than my traditional art. I literally now became almost a, a, an agent for this art that I made. But the genetic programming is their strategy. So in this case, there's these, these 14 these, uh, pieces of code. And if you look, there's cosine and tangent. So those are things that will make nice curves. You know, and but then is how it gets put together. So all those randomly go together in a program, making we'll call it a baby. Um, and then um, the idea is we're we're not telling it, but something gets made. And then in a blind room, so to speak, it's to, uh, another uh, judge decides how well it looks like Darwin. This is the most famous portrait of Darwin in the world. I like to say in the US, because sometimes we don't understand it's like it's the George Washington portrait of the UK. So this is at the National Portrait Gallery, and it's one of my favorite imagery. And of course, Darwin talks about evolution. Can you actually make a gallery full of his ideas, evolution by them evolving from nothing to try and get towards him? So that, that was this piece. It got on the cover of uh, on the journal Nature. Uh, and you can see, it's not perfect, but if you look at Darwin here, you can see his beard and his ovoid, and he's kind of, kind of there's a dark area here. And you'll constantly see that, this, this area, the, the, this part of the face maybe matches this. There's eyes that are showing up, you know, they're here. And these are, these are odd, but that's what's so nice about it, because they don't, this, these particular ones don't have the, the knowledge of, of art, they'll do things that I've never thought to do, uh, like reverse the hull of, of things. So all these are, have been were created. It was in the MIT Museum, where we put the timeline on the bottom here. And we um, and people were able to, we took the what we thought were the best pictures, like this one goes up here. So you're both seeing them as artwork and a timeline. This was at Cambridge University. Um, I was desperately trying to get these imagery on, on projectors to bounce all around the original Darwin. So the Darwin is a very famous picture. It's in the National Portrait Gallery. And, and they said, you're good, but are you crazy? It's like, why would we ever put a new artist in the 19th century room? And I'm like, OK, you're right.
okay, can we move the Darwin into the where you put new work? And then I can, and they thought it was crazy as well, too. And, and it was actually two years of negotiating with them because I thought what I really wanted to do that all these pieces are around what they're trying to move towards. Um, luckily for me, um, during uh, uh, Darwin's huge 150th uh, anniversary of his, of his birth and, the, and 100th of his book, they, the, the, that painting moved to Cambridge, and then I was finally able to do it in Cambridge. So, um, so the way this one works is it doggedly, the system doggedly tries to get better and better. Um, but what we did was we gave it a, a creativity notion. So we said, if you can't get better, OK, so here we are. If you look up at me here, here we, here's a big search space. Here's a big search space. Don't raise your hand that much. And here we are at one. And maybe this is the perfect Darwin of all the possible things this program can make. And one way, if you're not creative, is maybe to eventually, slowly get there. And you now you're finally there. And maybe you'll just get to something realistic and you won't find all the interesting stuff. What artists tend to do is they do it a little bit. They get frustrated that the tools, the world, isn't working the way they want to. So they're going to just stay in their head, they're going to rethink things, and they're going to open up to all possibilities. When we do an fMRI scan on, on creative people, they're firing in more parts of their brain a little bit. So there are certain people who get dyslexic if, if, if too much of their brain is going. They just want to be focused. But artists can defocus, and, they, and they're just going through things over and over again. And whether it's coming out of the shower or or being down on the beach and something about the waves, like, wait a minute. So that means when you open up to all possibilities, that wham, all of a sudden you kind of go, I have it, and you aha to an area. Now, often after that aha, you can have a problem again and go wide and do it. So if you were Paul McCartney, uh, in fact, the, the famous apocryphal story of, uh, of him and creativity is that um, uh, he would keep a, an old fashioned uh, tape recorder by his bed, because he would wake up in the middle of the night. And the big one was the song, Yesterday. He woke up, he, he, he hit the, in the old days, we used to have to record on the play button. And he did that, and he sang it, and then he went back to sleep. And it's not exactly as true as it could be, but the belief was that he woke up in the morning, forgot about it, saw the little light going on, that there was something there, and then played it. And this is what all creative people would like, to be able to judge their work with having no memory of it. So anyway, he did that, right? Uh, uh, and there it was. So that was total aha, right? Other things in his head, the way his dad used to talk to him when he would go to the field, that his mother died young, all these things are machinating in his brain. And then all of a sudden, this song comes out. Um, but then he said, oh, the words aren't right. So, so he totally ahas, but then he kind of goes more to this analytical of what would I do, how would I, and then he ahas again to solve that. So this is something that artists do a lot of, and I put it in a computer program where it bounces back between, so if you think of this system, it's like there's a patriarch uh, uh, program telling all the other programs that are related. Let's look exactly like Darwin. But I like to say there's the strange ants are going, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm related to you. So I do similar things to you, but I want to do funkier things. So it's a comet that I purposely have a wide tail. And to me, it's I'm always, so because uh, you can get into chaos. The, the key was, and this is literally now how we paint. So when I'm talking about AI, this is literally what the code I'm writing. I'm no longer thinking about how am I going to paint it. I'm thinking, of, oh, I know a trick. A trick is I can say look like Darwin, and, and this guy is, you know, this programmer is saying everyone look like Darwin, and I'll have these other ones kind of go kinda, but I'm going to think of other things, um, and that's where some of the beauty and magic comes up. Here's an example of it. Again, this is where we can use cognitive models. So this is called uh, fluidity. If you, if you look at the top, this is kind of the hierarchical patriarch saying fitness, just do fit, uh, just resemblance. Now, people were like always saying when I show them this work on the walls, um, oh, did, it, did, it, did they ever get to Darwin? I'm saying, well, you can get to Darwin in, in one line of code. It's called copy, right? So, so that's what we're after. We're trying to spark creativity. So um, this top is kind of like that. It's like we only care about resemblance. But what I, the wide tail is these fuzzy rules of art that I wrote in this computer program Simple things about composition. The composition is so simple, it's, hey, 
The middle matters more than the end. If you're going to do something good, don't have it go off to the end. That doesn't look good. Try and so I mean, those are very simple rules of, of composition, tonality, and color. And this was this was the show that I did from it. What was nice of it because uh, there was a gene set that would that uh, which is a recipe, and that recipe can be reused. You could point to anything in my show and say, I like this one and I like that one. Why don't you keep going? Marry those two together. So I said that to my wife, who, who I met in New York City, where she was an art director and I was an artist. We did a show together, and then we got married. Um, uh, she liked this one, this kind of donutty one, and she liked this this other kind of long one. And then well, I said, good, I'll, I will now move on. I will marry those together. I won't move them towards Darwin. I simply will just take the strategies from one. And this, so you can see that this first kind of offspring is taking these poles and bending them in the direction of the donut. So it's very different than morphing or what you might do in Photoshop. It's really marrying strategies. In some ways, this one is my favorite because if you look at this donut, it's a little thicker in one spot. So it's almost taking this one with these colors, so this one down here, and it's learning the notion of fatness, which I kind of like, right? So these are what a wonderful space if there are people in the room thinking, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I kind of like the drawer. It's like, well, this is the fun that you can get involved in. And we've done this evolutionary stuff also to make in rug design. And there's a big design company in town that uh, does things for the W uh, Hotel and other big hotels. So we were taking any design they make. And in the you just pick. I'll just do it this way. You just pick this one and that one if you like it. They get married together and you keep, and you just do this. It's like you're just walking down the street of creativity on every corner you're saying, well, which way do I want to go? And you just move through it and you could always bring old ones back and then we're into things like, oh, I like the shape of one but the color of the other. So these are the kinds of things that you do in your brain as a designer, but now we could put some of the color and weight on the systems to do it. Um, okay. C is there. There you go. Uh, one, one of the undergraduates we, we had in some of this image, and she was nice enough to show up now that she has a job in the real world. Um, so I'll show you uh, uh, more of this work. So some of it is, if you can do this art and it's changed, well, maybe we could use our body movement and our hand gestures and all these other things. So I'm going to go, so a lot of times when you're doing VR, you can use, and I'll show you in a second, these, this motion sensor and others. So once you're able to do art and it, it can move in space, well, you can just move literally, or you can say move towards Darwin, or you can say move based on my heart rate, or any other thing you want. So that's the, the notion I'm going to try and get out today. So when I put that up, uh, so there's different things you can do with these, these sensors that I showed you. One is we just put it on you so we understand how you feel. So that's the understanding. The other one is the user, oh, when you're in a video game or making art, you know, at least simple things happen. For this group, I would think we're more in this pro-authorship. I'm trying to make the best painting I can, and I could use my hand and my gesture, but I think I could scream it better, because it's just, you know, it, this painting is about my friend, it, you know, it was my 30th birthday, it was important to me, he's my best friend, I said, uh, can you come? He said, well, I got an issue, but it didn't seem like a big issue. And I don't think he gets that it bothers me. I'm going to, you know, because I play the saxophone, I'm going to do it. So we're trying to give you better tools to do that. Um, and I'll, I'll try and show. So this is this watch and more information about the watch. One of the things people say, well, what does the watch do? Well, um, uh, uh, it does um, all these kinds of things. And what I tend to do, although I decided to stop today, <laughs> is I leave it on during a talk. And then, um, so I usually leave it on for the whole talk. And then we get a whole list of what, how I felt during the talk. And then I save it and show it for the next. So this was a month ago when I gave a talk, what, how I was feeling. So I think for speed, I might just move on. Now, some of this stuff we're actually doing for health and things. So here's Sia again, who's, who's meditating and looking at these kind of natural forms that we're talking about. Um, and then um, I've already showed you um, how you might use this as a particle system. Um, but let me do it here with Mihai. On my screen, it's moving. And on your screen, it is not. Oh, there you go. 
that is just always the oddest thing. Okay. So Mie, this is my lab. You can be there. She's trying to get to a meditative state. So we do a lot with meditators, we do with Buddhist monks even. Um, so she's trying to calm herself down enough to work. Wait a minute. That was it, right? I did something wrong. Oh, OK. I'll just let it go. This is not the right one. So I'm going to show you a different one because I think it, it talks to it better. Uh, no, I don't know which one it's called. Uh, any questions as I'm bringing this one up? Just shout it out. Okay, here's a cloud of nothingness. Oh, again, it, 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 it takes a second for it. I, I'm seeing the video on my screen, but it takes a second. There you go. Here's a cloud that we could make more like Picasso or 3D. There it is. Hopefully you're seeing it. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so this is Unity. So this is really 3D. Mihai's going to come up to the screen and try and calm herself down. She's got the watch on, so we're tracking her. She's doing some breathing exercises. She's thinks. She's hit a level that at least it should start reacting to her. So because we have an accelerometer, we're watching that move. And we've decided, because she's kind of calm, that we're going to turn it into a version of her. So imagine you could be in a VR space. There's a whole bunch of spheres you can go into. One helps you in one way. And when you go there, there's a version of you that, in fact, is part of your heartbeat. So you'll see in a second that she's trying to control her heartbeat. And this is a little bit better looking than the one that I just showed you live. It, 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 uh, we're doing a lot more to make it more like cloud-like and, and different. Um, and there we go. And uh, if I let it go, you would see it has, she's doing breath. So we could put, we've been struggling with breath sensors. There's nothing more human than your breath. The trouble is, put, you know, with flus and things, putting a breath sensor in somebody's nose and then the next person isn't a very good thing. So one thing we realized, you could try it yourself if you're interested, is if you breathe but the side of your hand is up and down, like we don't even we don't have to do instructions. Within seconds, everyone's doing it perfect. So we're, we've been using this a lot as a breath controller. And we want to have breath paintings where you breathe paintings and this kind of work. So let me, let me show you some of those and get a little bit more into demos now. Uh, Going in a folder called art. That's a good thing. OK, so um, I'm going to use the leap motion. So I think I showed you the, da the dance was up, but I'm just going to go to it. One of the big problems with some of this stuff is paintings don't move. It's totally not obvious how you're supposed to make a painting movie at times. I have a little bit of a bug here. Wait a second. Let's see if I can make it go. I don't really want credits. So this is Shannon, a PhD dancer, who's doing a simple cycle dance. She's very good. She just had a baby, which means I can't do more dance work with her for a while. But we're going to start tracking the baby, and the baby's going to do stuff. OK, so here she is moving. I have, I have a, a leap motion. So when I'm quite low, we're getting some level of cubist look. I went crazy. Like my, OK, if I stop. So we have a whole bunch of different ways that you can interact with this. We want her to dance it. Why wouldn't she be in the middle of the floor dancing? And in her dancing, she's changing this other version of her. But I'm going to show you this one. So here she is dancing. I'm going to stop. So I'm, I spend a lot of time trying to make that image look as nice as it can. So we have cubism in there, so it's planar. We have these lines. Oh, I can't do that. I'll go pretty high and then stop. Mm -hmm. There you go. Oh, I gotta stay away. So there's these ink lines, which are the thicker lines. Stop. There you go. Um, and if you notice, the lines are are not on the original plane; they're off of it. So that's more human. And then everything is painted. So then there's painting, and then occasionally you're seeing this blob of paint or scratch of paint that's off the character to begin with. 
So these are all the things we're, we're trying to support. Like above her head is a little piece of yellow. Why is that there? Let's see if I can get a bigger one going. Okay, so I'm going to see the stroke. Okay, so, but I can control it. So I'm going to control it with my hand. Up here, it's super abstract. It's literally the same video. And as I move down, and you don't have to watch my hand, it's just moving down. But uh, uh, you can look at the screen because that's the art. Um, it's getting more and more at the level we decided to go. And I can, I can uh, have it go backwards or forwards if I go in this other direction. So I can control this. So why don't I try? So I'm going to get a speed that I like, like there. And I'm going to decide every time she twirls, I will go more abstract. So twirl. So if you've seen it now, watch my, what I'm doing in my hand is twirl, I went too fast, twirl, twirl. Now, I don't want to go fully up. I don't think that looks good. So I'm deciding artwork-wise what I want. And eventually, I can do a whole thing. Now, I could do this by shouting, or I could do this by breathing. Or I can say to someone who says, it's a chaotic world. I'm confused. I'm not happy. You're my uh, social worker. What should I do? Breathe and try and bring your world back. So uh, while I'm doing this with my hand and a cheap $80, I love this thing, 80 bucks. If you, if you do VR, people are like, oh, there's a new controller. I keep going, this one works with your hands, both hands. Works every time, 80 bucks. We don't need these other fancy things. So right now, if you've done VR, they're using controllers. I'm like, hey, if I'm into art, I'm obviously into natural. So I'd rather you use your hands. So this is an example. Let's go a little deeper. So this is a program. Stop. Any questions about this? This is, um, so we're questioning this in a million different ways. We don't know how you'd want to play it. We don't know, should you, should you go from realistic to surreal? for certain kinds of coming, or do you go the other way? So all this stuff is quite new. Again, paintings don't move, and there's a, while it engages you, it's not obvious, and, and we're excited about making things that look good. The application space is a bit odd. Now, I was just down back in Stanford, and I gave a whole bunch of talks, and I was really excited that these neuroscientists, because I always think it's for problems, but to, to help people. They're saying, no, 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 it's for analysis. We have people with, with dementia who are not responding to drugs. And we, when we put an MRI on them, they are, they are atypical. In other words, there's 25% of dementia people who something different in their brain is happening. Who, if they use this tool and they all ended up in a certain spot because it's variable, we would know they're, they have something that turns out there's someone who can barely deal with the world because he was almost blind. And it turns out he's got a form of autism that's super sensitive to blue. The whole world is just different colors of blue to him. He makes the most beautiful, subtle blue paintings in the world. And it, they want to get this to him because they can understand where that's happening. So I'm going to show you a different one that's now going to bring up a different kind of AI. So the last AI we saw, that is just really odd looking. Is that really working? I think it is working. OK, so I'll do this. Um, so this is newer. This is using deep learning. So deep learning, if I am working, show me that you're working. There you go. So uh, it, it, let's pretend what you're looking at is some version of consciousness. Or if somebody painted that, historically, what artists do you think painted that? Van Gogh, Van Gogh I heard. Do, do people see that? It's his colors. So this was created by hallucinating towards Van Gogh. So, uh, so this is now deep learning. Sorry, it's always hard to figure out, how, should I stop or just show it? Or do some people want to know how deep learning works? So deep learning is a cheat, like so many others. They say it's the future and wonderful. But I know it's just cheap categorization. So imagine if you had pictures of trees and pictures of telephone poles, and you, you kept telling this computer, this is a tree. This is a telephone pole. This is the tree. And every time you put it in, it rewired its network to try and go, I need a version 
that I can figure out the difference. And then hopefully you're going to give it a new tree or a telephone bulb picture, and it will have learned to do it. That's exactly how all deep learning works, except with more categories. And when Street View, this AI system that goes down your block, it's looking for license plates, because license plates have to be blurred. It's looking for faces, because they got to be blurred. Anything with a number on, because it's Google, they would like to get. Among other things, if they get the, your, your address from your house, they can match it with the GPS, and they can keep, you know. So they're doing all that. I'm doing it too. That's on objects. That's saying a dog and cat. We don't want to do objects in art. We want to do style. We want to do feelings. So that's a little bit harder to do. In this case, I have taken, stolen, we might even say, with the help of even the UBC librarian at times, who's going, can you do that? I'm like, I don't care. I think I would like to do it. Which is, I've taken 52 gigabytes of every piece of art that's ever been made and labeled from Google, from, from, from uh, WikiArch, from all of And I teach the computer how to do them. So this now knows about art. And this is a deep learning. It's a little bit odd. So it tries to learn art. And then, it, and then, it, and then we do something that most of these systems don't do. Because all they need to do is get to the top. When they get to the top, it says it's a license plate, or it's a thing. Or, and, and that's all they're doing. We're, we're, we're going generative. We're going, so this going up, this thing is going from uh, uh, small shapes to, to uh, so imagine a tube gets recognized like a thin leg. And that's two or three up this neural network. And then higher up, there, it's using that tube, so it's pointing back to it, either to make a tube building or it's the leg of a flamingo. So higher up, now it's turning into the leg of a flamingo. And as you get all the way up to the top, flamingo, I got it. Did I get it right or not? So that's how all these systems work, low-level things. And then they share all those low-level things, and they keep building up to the guy. So we're doing all that, but we're going back down again. And when we go back down again, we change the pixels. And when we change the pixels, we make art. And then if you've heard of Deep Dream, we let it hallucinate. It, Deep Dream is called dreaming, but it's really hallucinating. So what is hallucinating? Mm -hmm. I claim it's just biasing when you don't have good information, or you're biased because you're, you're on drugs, mm -hmm. or you're biasing for other reasons. So my favorite thing is there's a family, young girl, she's getting older, she hates that. That basement, just the lights don't work well. The boogeyman's when she was young. She hates to go down to the basement. Um, but dad said go down to the basement. She's older, it's getting a little bit better. But on the way down, her evil younger brother says, watch out for snakes. So she's now biased with the word snakes. She goes down to the basement, what do you know? Dad doesn't have the lights working. And in fact, there was a slight flood. Not a big flood, enough when she walks around, something, there's a little bit of reflection on the floor, and she screams snakes and run out the door. The only reason she's thinking snakes is because she, her brain does not have enough information about what's going on, and, um, and snakes is in her mind. So that's what's happening here. OK, so let's, let's make this more interesting. I am totally cupping this, because I know full, I love this image. I know full is like that, but let's stop moving it up. I'll look at your screen. So what is that now? Sure enough, that's a tree in my backyard in Deep Cove. My wife is like, what are, what are you doing out there? Well, I'm taking pictures. I'm going to turn into Van Gogh. Um, so if I go way down, it's quite Van Gogh-y if I move up. It isn't. How do they get these colors? How do they get these layers? So I, I'm playing in the history of all of art and Van Gogh and noticing what works well. By the way, what doesn't work well, I don't usually like it, is um, Van Gogh seems to sit on top of the work. I call it a screen door effect. I don't like it as much, where it looks like it's not really on the work. I'll show you other ones where you feel like it's changing the style. In fact, if I get in the middle here, notice on contrast, it's just vibrating. A lot of those right about here, a lot of those circles are coming from the non-branch part. Let me just do it. So sometimes the circles are just right on top. Somewhere around here, you feel like they're emanating from that spot. So we're trying to fix that. I don't like that. I, I would like it where the branches change shape to it, not just sit on the top. So this is wonderful. I decided that this tree in my backyard, well, well, going back there and doing some chores, reminded me, being a Van Gogh guy, of Arles and the trees that he's taking pictures of. So I took a video of it now, and I can move through that video in certain ways. So again, breathe in. 
or any other kind of way you'd want to use this. So I'm now starting to show you examples of the work we're doing. We've just got two major films in, um, of, of work like that. So now we're working with dancers. And I don't know why my screen might go ahead, so give me one second to figure out what I just did wrong here. My screens are bad. Control C, maybe even. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull my HDMI and put it back in, because I, I don't know what did that. I can't imagine it's my computer. Oh, maybe it is my computer. Oh, look at that. I have no computer. So um, any, uh, how many people would be interested in, um, in trying to work with some of these things? Um, because we are. Oh, I see. It is on my, now it's on my screen here. Now hopefully it goes back to your screen. And maybe I just have to hit a button. So I pulled it. I, could, I guess I could have tried there first. Oh, good. We're back. So that's good. Um, so we do stuff now with dancers. So this is a dancer who's dancing live. And notice what happens. Her, her arm has disappeared for a second. And then it comes back. So this is one of the things we notice with this particular dreaming approach is shapes will, will turn into each other and separate out. So we're trying um, to actually do that. So look what these dancers did. They actually put, with, with me, we did a shoot. We put cellophane through the space, just plastic. It was like crazy. They were falling over it. At one point, I was, I was hiding underneath it because we didn't want this. Uh, right now, there's a tripod there with a 360 camera on it. But at some point, I'm, I'm there like holding it up. And this is what we get out of it. Oops, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm doing more dangerous stuff here. Uh, there we are, sorry. Um, so we can get uh, um, new forms of dance where dancers come together, they separate, and what is painting could look very different. So I'll show, I'll show you a little bit more of that. Again, we do a lot in this, in this how people talk and things, so I'm going to leave that out for now. But you know, if you're interested, you can always look through that. Um, and of course, there's really, has anyone used tilt brush in the, in the room? No, I can't do it. So there's now, this is being VR where I'm painting in space. And I'm, I'm making these ribbons. And it's quite wonderful uh, uh, because of the movement aspect. If I want to paint the back of something, I literally got to get to the ground and kind of go down. And it's just really gestural. I, I really enjoy it. We, we just did a piece where, um, um, for palliative care. So a very famous muralist from San Francisco, unfortunately, has cancer and, is, and, and is, doesn't have long to live. So we've taken all his murals, all of San Francisco, and been at a show. And they're going to use VR. And uh, if you're looking up at me on the screen, each one of these ribbons actually has his work on it. And then some of it I'm using my, uh, I take his work and I turn it uh, simpler and simpler, like you've seen. And women will move through it, and they experience it, and then they'll stop, and they'll either, they can talk at that point, and we say what they, and it'll have this yes. new form of really experience this person's work. It's going to be his last particular show. And the notion that somebody is setting up the environment, not by making an environment, but actually gesturally moving around, you can see how many new kinds of tools there are. So these are things I've quickly done. And now I'm going to just move on to some of the work. So this is the style of art that we can do. This is just a computer game character. And I just want to show even a game character we can make look very different. And you already know what we've done with, with the Rembrandt work. So again, my, my student here, Rembrandt, it's not copying Rembrandt, but it is trying to understand what Rembrandt does. And what we tried to prove, by the way, uh, that you do not have free will when you look at this picture. I told a thousand people at the National Portrait Gallery, even though one of the people was the number one Rembrandt person, he was panicked. Uh, and computer people and, and art people. And at some point, one of the computer people said when they saw I could make this level of work, oh, you could use your, your software to um, figure out what's fake and what's real with Rembrandt, which I was ready for. What did I do at a desk like this? I said, no, you could never have scientists tell artists what to do, that we could, we could inform critics, 
but but a computer program trying to say it was a good member, and I was doing it because I believe in it, but I also wanted to make sure the art side of the audience realized this isn't this isn't the real big issue here. It turns out that Rembrandt totally owns your eye. Uh, you think you're a free will, but we've done the study. You go to this the sharper eye uh, uh, faster, you stay there longer, and it's a total heat, heat sink. And then he's done all of um, sorry by heat sink I mean attention sink. You just you just keep going there. In fact, most Westerners come in this way. They hit an edge. You follow edges. He loses the edge right here to bring you right in. And then highlights are a good trick. He's got all the highlights going into this eye. He's even got these little pieces of red going right to the eye. So you think, so let's think about what art is. You go, oh, that's a great picture of Susie. It's not only a resemblance, she, he's got the inner, he's got everything about Susie. So is that magic? Is that special dust? No, it's an artist who interviews hangs out with your daughter Susie, sees she talks out of the side of the mouth, sees that bright thing, and then uses techniques to do it. So we made one point press here at UBC. I got in huge trouble for it, by the way, because I was at SFU, but my degree was here at UBC. SFU, sorry SFU to say bad things about UBC. Oh, I, I'm live on camera. Sorry SFU. But um, their, their science PR is less as good. I, I was worried that they weren't going to tell um, a deeper story. We did it at UBC. We worked with the, the gang here, and we were we were. I was in deep cove, and I'm on the phone as the story broke. And I said to my wife, I "said the CBC wants to come up. They want me to go into the city and, and talk about this." I was saying, "I can't do that because the calls keep coming in. Can we? Can we just? Can they come up here? They'll come up to deep cove. They're showing." I'm saying, "Are you kidding with your mess?" And uh, I convinced her that we'd only go into the living room with the grand piano, and I would bring up my monitor, and they could do the talk. But anyway, it, it, uh, where I got in trouble, because UBC researcher, it turns out UBC prof is le less letters than UBC researcher. So when I said re UBC researchers figured out the magic of Rembrandt, it quickly became UBC prof became in. And people at SFU were going, did you lose? But anyway, let me show you what the work is. So it's a system that thinks cognitively about all the forms. Now, if you were a, a human, you would know the different parts of uh, the face because there's rules about how you do the hair differently. So I've spent, I've read like every art book there is, and for years I was just putting together what I would call the passed on methodology of how painters paint. And we tried to put it in this system. Um, so, Here's me. If you say, how much do you care about the stuff? I would say, enough to shave my beard like a, uh, so I look more like Rembrandt for this. But see this sharp eye here, how sharp it is? See this lost and found edge that, that you, you'd fall in here? So what we tried to prove is um, that somehow Rembrandt understood that you don't see everything in the world at one. If you hold up your thumbnail, only your arm, only your thumbnail is fully in focus. 10 times less, 10 times less. You think you're seeing this world in front of you. But what you're doing with these nine muscles or six muscles in your eye is you're moving around and you're, you're building up your world. And, we, and this is the genius story. We tried to prove, well, artists do this. And then we tried to figure out how far back does it go. And we decided it's late Rembrandt. It's only when Rembrandt could actually put in a big piece of yellow in modernism and people didn't think it was weird, then he's putting in big pieces of yellow to go, look that way and look this way. And when you do that, you can, you can tell the inner story, not just the outer story. So we, I tracked people here, and we kept switching the eyes. So this is the eye in the wrong spot, right? So that's the blurred eye that's like this. And then we switched from the way he did it, which is you lose the edge, so you have an edge. We follow edges, and this is the perception part. We know that now that humans do that. And then you'd lose it right here by losing the contrast, and you come right in. So lost and found edges, now people talk about, but back then they didn't. Look what we did. We falsely didn't lose the edge. You have to go around now. We blurred this side, which was strong, and we switched the eyes. And we got everyone to look the other way. You know, So it turns out you do this, and you look that way. So again, you don't have free will. Here's another image, again, that we use. So even though we like that we're making good art, it's the variability of the art that made us be able to tell. So here's a Rembrandt. Here's Greg, the PhD. And this is some of the, the work we're able to get. This is me, and you can see 
that, that strong eye, it just drives you there. You think and it's pretty significant. So what we claimed as a UBC piece of research that made big press that, in fact, you know, he owns you when he does this. And that's how he tells your story. Um, here's the original one. It's just all over. Who knows why he put in, I'll show you right here. This thing goes directly across to the eye. Look at this one, it goes to the eye. And then there's a circuit, like everything he's doing is to get you to this eye to tell a story. Now sometimes you want to look somewhere else, and he does it to create tension. And if you know like the, the girl with the, with the um, yes, the pearl earring, some of that is to actually cause tension, to, to want you to look one way, and you have to look the eye. So we did a lot with this work, and you can see this is the areas that we changed. And without getting into all the detail, sure enough, you, you go to that sharp eye much faster than the blurred eye, and we proved scientifically. And we even tried, this was one of the hardest things I ever did at UBC, is um, to have all the highlights. So we were saying the strength is actually uh, the, the detail and the lost and found edges, but these highlights, these bright lights that come in afterwards, we have them all going to the correct eye. Here I have them all going to the wrong eye to see if it influences you, and then we have it all over the place. So if you know Jim Engs, he's a very smart man, he's head of the Vision Lab, but this is where we parted ways. He said, okay, this is great, Steve, you have a painting program that can make Rembrandt, you guys are gonna like look like Rembrandt enough to do the lighting, we did it all, he goes, now do the way Rembrandt would do it wrong. I'm like, okay, Rembrandt wouldn't do it wrong, so I, I don't know what to do. So it was very hard for me to do the highlights the wrong way and claim this is the way that Rembrandt would have done the high right, highlights, right? He, he doesn't do it. So you have to watch the science and art. And this is why a lot of people in art go, I mean, in science go reductionary. And a, another big thing about interdisciplinary and art and science that I'm trying to say here is we're able to make a puppetness of art. Oh, I like that. I'll call that art. Oh, good. Now we can vary it and we can do studies. Normally you think, well, there's too much else going on. So we'll just have a lot of times they'll literally have two dots and an arrow, and you're doing it that way. So there's a there's a tension between over-reducing it to get rid of all the problems, but then the real reality isn't there anymore. And then we're the other way and get beat up a little bit that we're actually doing all this, you know, we're making real paintings, but we're trying to own them. By the way, we did a forced choice, they call it, which we did all four ways of putting the eyes together. It should have been, if it was fair, it should have been 25% guess. 53% of the time, you said, I don't know why. In fact, your eyes just went to the way that Rembrandt did it. So, so we're here, we, we said, he never wrote it down. It doesn't matter. He did it. He became famous for it. We at least are taking his techniques and we're mixing them up. And sure enough, the way he did it is the way humans like it. The dude was a genius. And 200 years before a French person realized while looking at um, uh, uh, kids reading that they jump from line to line, and to this day we still call it a saccade. And so that's when we started realizing, oh, this is this fovea vision. Well, I at least, and again, it was so controversial, saying Rembrandt intuited it beforehand. What else do artists know? that scientists don't know yet, and we just have to put this apparatus on. So anyway, there it is. I just want you to, I literally, this, this one is in my hometown, in the, in the Met in New York City, and I, I got special permission to take a very high res image of it. There really are these pieces of red here that go directly to the sharp eye. Who knows why this red is here? This, this highlight, which is usually a highlight, goes right across. So, I mean, I'm even more sure when I get these high res scans that they do it. Okay, so I'm, I'm closing in here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about creativity as it goes. So this is an artist, Souk, who sits in the, in the UBC Vision Lab and, and draws this stuff, and we watch everywhere she looks. And we've decided that artists, they're just, their eyes go up and down in a particular way. So we've made some decisions about how creativity works. Very hard to do, but that's what we're doing here. We've been told, oh, you figured out Rembrandt. That's pretty good. Does Picasso work the same way? It's like, no, it's like there's probably hundreds of techniques. We've at least figured a few of them where when we vary them, it makes sense. But what we like to say is this. So in this image, here's the brain of Rembrandt, let's say. And he's got all these possibilities of making swirls versus other things. And because of the way he lived, he's decided he's figured out something to make a great painting, or a better way to say it, to make a universal truth. 
And this is you 300 years later looking at it. And you've caught his universal truth. In other words, he's changing the painting to, to affect his brain. And it's affecting your brain enough where you kind of go, damn, I, I get that. Now it's slightly different. You lived on the farm, he didn't, or whatever the issue is. So we've been at least trying to make this claim that there's this level of connection that goes on. OK, so I'm going to um, So I've showed you the newer system since that Rembrandt system that's much more um, uh, hand. It, it's got a better hand look to it. So that's these imagery. Um, uh, I do sometimes even sculpture with it and in both. Um, and now we're even thinking about how an AI will see things differently. So we wrote a program that it's looking at the same abstraction, but it actually picks out different things. So we're really trying to hit this from all directions. Uh, I did a well-known piece that, that, that went around the world in an art show where um, I took pictures of my friends on Facebook. If you're on Facebook with me, it's very dangerous because I will take your selfie and make art out of it. I think it's because I think portraits are amazing, but the, the, the most banal version of a portrait surely is a selfie. So I like taking a selfie and trying to, so this was a piece called Bring Out the Ghost. I took my friend Josh, and over time, I kept stepping on him until he almost turns into this ghost-like thing. Because what is Facebook? You say it's you, but it's, you're just kind of a number, and it doesn't really matter. And So, so all this work is, uh, is taking friends, and trying to, and I literally just keep painting on top of painting, which is something that you can do in a computer. So I'm painting a painting and then changing it till it, again, they go a little bit ghost-like at times. Um, uh, my PhD said, God, these have real emotions. What, have you ever tested them? Why don't you take these images uh, uh, and recipes? So it doesn't always have to be the same image. We could put it in a different source. And you could, put, you could put them on a chart and say, what do you feel about them? So we did that, and it turns out certain recipes or styles made people feel the same way. And this is where it's moved into uh, uh, e-health, because we can, you can sit down, we can take eight pictures of you, and we can say, how do you feel today? He's like, I feel like the crazy one. OK, well, let's do the breathing and try and get you to move towards it. But in VR, we're actually trying to say, well, no, we, we don't even have to say to move there. It will move there because you have the biosensing on. So you can see how some of this kind of fits in the space. Um, we're doing that with movement, where you, you move for five seconds. We track your movement. And then we make this big wall painting. Now, this is the calm one. We could have made this calm one or these others that we've proved now. But I think we went happy. So this is the version of, of them happy. So imagine this thing's in front of you. It's a big wall painting. And you go, what's that again? You go, that's you. That's your movement. It, go, what, what's with this big empty spot here? So we move differently there. So this was a contract we had because people never move to understand their movement. So we think we could even do more because we could put uh, your biorhythms and other things in here now. This is another one. We could have used the, the same happy recipe, but we used the calm one. So these are styles. So now you can see how we could get movement into art. We can get yelling into art. We can get therapy into art. Um, I was a little annoyed that some of this stuff on the abstraction side was still about just changing the size of the stroke. And, and real abstraction is in the head. So these are this, these new works that you, I've been showing you where we're getting these, um, we get planes. And then we're putting edge lines on them. And then there's even a painting technique in here. So these are, this is me, a version of me. That's literally still a version of me, just going to very few and, and changing the style. So there's a lot here of the painting style as well. So what we call this thinker painter now, which is you think about the abstraction, and you paint it afterwards. So the painting is the stroking, but we can do all different kinds of painting that are different than the abstraction level because we want to get more in the brand. This is a very gesso looking one. So that's still me. You can see how this stuff can really be three dimensional. So as you've seen, we're doing it with the dancer in, in interesting ways. And we can get very different looks from this look to that look. Um, this is the one that was in the poster that I've been, we've been using a lot as well. Uh, uh, this is me in AI hallucinating with the trees where I walk around in Deep Cove. 
So if you can see some of the stuff going on in the beard, maybe there you can see I'm literally in my downstairs bathroom. There's nothing, nothing wonderful about the fluorescent light that I took because I looked in the mirror. I'm going, oh, that would be good. Right? So I just put the camera down and took it. But then I was able to match it with trees and these are other styles. Um, I, I give these talks worldwide. Facebook asked me to come by. They love all my face stuff. I'm going, I wonder what I can do with like a post. So this didn't go over as well as I thought. So this is Jan Lacan. Some people might know him. He's the head of, of AI research. At, he's actually from Montreal, as almost all AI people are from Canada somewhere. So we have a bit of money. And this was a post he wrote on Facebook. He said, mathematics meets jazz meets science. The New York Times wrote a nice piece about my friend Terry. He said he was surprisingly normal. So he's just talking to other nerds going, oh, isn't that cute? They think we're normal. Um, we tried to turn that post into a, paint, uh, a painting. So I'll show you another one here where we use AI on the words. See the word swatch, much, church, all in red. So we're looking at the words, we're looking at the cha sounds, and that's making this red, this red line here that actually makes a brush stroke that way. So we're, we're literally obviously trying to do dance to art, uh, in this case, poetry to art. How well did this work, Steve? Did Facebook go, this is great and amazing? Or did they say, could you go back to the faces? And, and you can, I can tell you that, that this was too esoteric for them. Um, OK, so um, I'm going to finish off with a couple more things to show you. So a picture of me. And these are these different styles. So this is me uh, 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 biased with Volkswagens, bugs. So is this one. This one is with creatures. This is more typical deep dream. This is this now we're going to stroke or make a world of art that's all based on that being the element. So you can see that the strokes become the feathers and the eyes are around and then there. So it really does open up the space in many, many ways. And even when we go back to our original techniques, it makes all those original Rembrandt techniques much better. So whether you think this one, I didn't do the Rembrandt. But this one, there's just so much extra subtlety by adding the deep cream that we're very excited by it. Um, so we go back to Rembrandt with this newer style. Here's a Rembrandt, and here's a deep dream, not using that six years of cognitive work, but it was faster. And I have to admit, the oiliness, the kind of the wet oiliness in this is showing up in places, and it never showed up in the old work that I showed you. So uh, Deep Dream is much more holistic about understanding space, and then you're, you obviously are trying to work with that space. Um, so. In the newer work, we're actually doing all this AI in different ways. And artists like Picasso, in that stuff that I just showed you with planes, it wouldn't make the same, he wouldn't make the same planes all over. Given my thing about he's trying to draw your eye, where he wants you to look, there probably would be smaller planes and or circles. And if you think of his cubist work, that would make more sense. So this is what I mean where we're using several AI systems to get more creative. This AI system has looked at where people look at things. And it makes heat maps. So when most humans look at the, this picture of me, you spend more time in my eyes. So I'm supposed to do it like this. The in my mouth. So they've done hundreds of these. Remember the example of the tree and the telephone pole. So now we're just getting more complicated. With uh, we get an eye tracker, we see where you look, and we train you, and hopefully we can give you a new picture of anything, and we can get that. So we just, I just came back from Stanford and I was showing the difference between um, low, low planes or, or high planes everywhere or being smart knowing the, that this, this, this should have less planes and the thing you look at more, which is the horse, should have more. Um, so we actually just did a study on this and um, we got this work. We, we, uh, it's always hard to compare and make studies on art, but we, we, we I know this is kind of weird. But we, we, we did a search term, analytic cubism, in Google Images. And we took the first 100 pictures. And if they were professional, and unfortunately all the professionals were Picasso and Brock. So we went, oh god, that's going to be hard to beat them. And then if they were amateurs, we put them in a different category. So we showed people, and they rated them. And then they rated the hours. And we were very happy to see that hours rated much higher towards the Picassos. 
Um, so this is salience used another way. See, in deep dream, it gets too tricky to figure out what you're looking at. So the salience helps because that's what an artist would do. They would put more detail where you want it. Now we're doing this. I'm going to move on to some of the last things, which is AI anonymization, this Google thing we have. So um, in fact, I should even be, yeah, I think this is small enough. Um, these people were a bit persecuted in, in China. They're, they're, um, um, so we're, we, we abstract them. But if we abstract everything, which is down here, it's incredibly beautiful, but it doesn't always get me to think about the people. So we can use the salience to, to get me to look. And we have these beautiful images. And I do, can do the same thing with my hand. These people, in, in fact, I don't want to leave it on too long for a particular reason. But uh, they're actually chanting. And they're chanting in a way that calms them all down in this group thing that they've been doing for 2,000 years. So it's really amazing for us that we're doing anthropology and e-health. And it turns out the anthropology of these people have been doing e-health with meditation for years and years and years. So you actually, in that piece, as an anthropological piece, move the way they do. And eventually, they rise up. So these are other areas. So our journalism grant is, in, is for the following. So here is my... I remember I, I looked in my purse. I, I didn't have my phone. I didn't have any money. So sorry about... Uh, I don't everything. know why videos don't always start. Go ahead, let's start again. I remember I, I looked in my purse. I, I didn't have my phone. I didn't have any money. Uh, everything that I would usually have wasn't there. So I realized that maybe someone had taken my things. So that's an issue. No it's being filmed. It's in a documentary. We want you to feel everything about her. I remember I, I looked in my purse. I, I didn't have my phone. I didn't have any money. So I want this. Uh, everything just, it'll start up in a second. That I, would, I remember I, I looked in my purse. I, I didn't have my phone. I didn't have any money. So do you feel her? Everything do you feel the way she moves? Does it matter that you don't see her eyeballs? Someone had taken my things. And uh, no passport. So. I also didn't so this is the work we're doing. We can even change the style. See how it got more green? Based on, so another kind of AI could be called tone analysis, where we can look at the stress in her voice, and we can change the, the style live. So she's got an issue. She wants to tell the world. It's coming out of her soul. Because it's coming through her face, it would be nice for you to see it. But with art, we could hopefully take everything that's in her soul and still get it out in reasonable ways, either from her voice or, and again, we're working with, um, that's the, this project is Kate Hennessy, who's an anthropologist, an mm -hmm. PhD, now at my school, and uh, Taylor Owen, who's quite big in the journalism school, and the three of us got this grant, so we're always working on it. Here's a, here's a different one where, um, I, I felt really afraid to come back. I felt really afraid to come back here. So it's I not moving. Show you. I think it's some memory thing. I, I can never figure out why this happens. I to show you where this happened. So come with me. You're still not seeing it move. I, I felt really afraid to come back here, but I wanted to show you where this happened. So come with me. Not moving. Okay, let's try it again. I felt really afraid there to come back here, but I wanted to show you where this happened. Note the style on her face and the style we're using. I'm going to stop it because I actually clicked on the wrong one. So if you notice that style, that's a nice style. We think this one is a slightly better style. You can decide. I, I felt really afraid to come back here, but I wanted to show you where this happened. Give it a sec. I think on Let second me. pass, it'll catch up as well. By the way, this never ever used to happen. There's something about HDMI that is way too smart because it should be a video signal. It should never I, I delay like this. I'm really afraid to come back here, but I wanted to going. show you where this happened. Come with me. Okay, so I'm going to just let it go. So I've showed you because we're getting over here. Oh, there you go. Now she's moving. So my salience we could push on her because it's too decorative. You don't care about her. It's Quiet all is. about her. I'm, I'm terrified. <laughs> so that's a style. Some of the style looks as beautiful, you know, sorry to say that, uh, in my book, as the painter, uh, as the dancer. So we're really excited about how this looks. Sometimes too beautiful means you don't notice. 
So another thing we're going to do, maybe here even at UBC, is we're going to do three things. We're going to show people the original thing for her, and we're going to ask her, are you empathetic to them? Are you empathetic with the character? Do you remember what they said? And a whole bunch of, and then we're going to show the number one way that they do it, you know, right now, which is which is uh, a dynamic uh, pixelation. And then we're going to show this. Uh, and we have so many different styles of this, we're not really sure which one to show. And the hope is that this is much closer to the raw one than it is to the other. And we would hope then we could give to the world a much different kind of, of anonymization that, that, so you can really feel the people in Syria and so and so. So I've given you a, um, a, a whirlwind tour of, of making art with computers, some of the applications in it, how art and science gets put together, how interdisciplinary art works, how interdisciplinary research works, and how a little bit of AI works. So um, I'm ready to answer any questions you have, and thank you very much.